Hey everyone, I can see that a number of participants are joining the meeting. Um, so I will maybe um, just get a thumbs up from my team to say that we can proceed and go ahead. Okay, I will start. Um, so welcome to uh, this session. I would like to start by acknowledging that I'm joining you from the land of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation and pay my respect to elders past um, and present. It's really important uh, when talking about something like feminist foreign policy to acknowledge the ongoing project of colonization and the impact this has had on and continue to has on First Nation people in Australia, as well as other countries in, the, in this region. Um, here in Australia, colonization has systematically devalued the knowledges and worldviews of First Nation people, and it is critical that feminist approaches be informed by and create space for this knowledge, and we'll have a chance to go into more depth around this today. Thank you all for joining us um, and to explore with us the opportunities for feminist foreign policy in the Indo-Pacific. Uh, please do introduce yourself in the chat and, and let us know where you're joining us from today and even what time it is for you. We know and acknowledge that um, CSW brings a lot of complexity around um, time zone and including our panelists, uh, um, for some of them have been up for 17 hours. So acknowledging their strengths and power in joining us in this context. This session is co-hosted by IWDA and the Kuba 9 Initiative. IWDA is an Australian-based organization. We're resourcing women's rights organization in Asia and the Pacific, and we're working with global feminist movements to advance our vision of gender equality for all. Um, also, we are convening the um, Australian Feminist Foreign Policy Coalition, which is a diverse network of individuals and organizations that are advancing uh, feminist foreign policy in Australia. The Kubernetes Initiative uh, is uh, an Indian-based organization that's exploring opportunities for more gender mainstreaming in Indian foreign um, policy through research and through consultative processes. And you will hear um, directly from my colleague Priyanka Bide in a moment. Um, so what I would like to do is to begin this session, myself and Priyanka will each share about our organization's work on feminist foreign policy. Once we've done that, that will help us have some scene setting and some framing of our discussion. We will then hear from our, hear from our panelists who um, will dig deeper into the opportunities and the challenges for applying this approach into the um, Indo-Pacific region. And then, of course, we'll give some space for uh, Q&A. Uh, we will be monitoring uh, the Q&A function, so please Post your question as we go along. Um, you can start now um, and we will monitor that. And so we will have a dedicated time towards the end of our session to, to come to them. So I'm gonna ask my, um, my colleague, um, Alice, to um, share screen now um, as I take you through only about three slides. So uh, bear with me, just as I said, wanting to make sure we have some good context setting. So, um, to frame the discussion, I'd like to share this definition that we have that's developed with the Australian Feminist uh, Foreign Policy Coalition, um, which is feminist foreign policy is an approach which places gender equality at the central goal of foreign policy in recognition that gender equality wow. is a predictor of peaceful and flourishing societies. We know globally that gender equality is the most important factor in predicting peaceful societies, more important even than wealth and democracy. In this context, um, and you know, the context of this year's CSW theme, we also know that climate change and peace are inextricably linked. In the Pacific, the Board Declaration of the Pacific Island Forum actually identifies really clearly that climate change is the greatest security threat um, facing the region. We also know that climate impacts um, are gendered and climate uh, induced disasters lead to increases in sexual and gender based violence and increases in burden of unpaid care and domestic work for women. Um, we also know decades of experiences in the women peace and security agenda has shown us that we need women's leadership and meaningful participation in peace building in all areas of public life. But we know that's not enough if, if this is just a standalone. So a feminist approach 
is about emphasizing what we need to transform the global system which uphold and perpetuate inequality for women, for trans and gender diverse people, as well as inequality based on race, religion and class in order to create a peaceful world where everyone can flourish. That next slide gives you a really sort of uh, brief uh, timeline of uh, feminist brand policy across the world. So there are nine countries now that have announced feminist brand policies. Sweden was the first pioneering the concept in 2014, followed then by Canada, France and Luxembourg. Mexico became the first uh, global South country to make this commitment in 2020, and then Libya, the first African nation. Uh, in the past year alone, we've now seen Spain, Germany, and most recently only about 10 days ago, Chile joined the group. Um, while the interest in feminist foreign policy is growing each year, it's important to acknowledge it is still an emerging discipline. Uh, with each country taking its own approach to defining the principles it sees as critical uh, to a feminist approach. So taking a step back in 2019, we at IWDA partner with the uh, International Center for Research on Women and the uh, NYU Center for Global Affairs to hold a workshop at CSW at the time we were able to be physically there focused on hearing the voices of women in the global south. That workshop brought together 40 participants from 19 countries to discuss their priorities for the principles and accountability mechanism um, that should underpin feminist foreign policy. And so on this slide, you see uh, a takeaway um, of that. So basically from this workshop, what's emerged is seven principles. Uh, you can see one obviously is about based on human rights, both in terms of goal, the goal that it sets out to achieve, but also in the way a country goes about advancing um, that goes through its foreign policy. Um, advancing human rights, um, in advancing human rights, feminist foreign policy should also reinforce the role of the state as the ultimate duty bearer and should not elevate uh, the market as a delivery mechanism or outsource the provision of public goods and services to the private sector. That was very loudly heard from all those participants. Feminist foreign policy must also be transformative of the status quo. Um, this means that any announcement of feminist foreign policy, which is not followed by actually significant shifts in policy and in practice, should be viewed as suspicious. Um, you know, it also means we need to remember that gender equality is not just about equality between men and women on an individual level. It's about actually transforming structures of inequality and marginalization that perpetuate inequality based on gender and other factors. You see on the fourth principle, uh, inclusive uh, and intersectional, meaning it's not solely preoccupied, as I just mentioned, with gender, but with intersecting forms of marginalization. Uh, and, and recognizing marginalization that's perpetrated through colonialism, structural racism, capitalism, and more. And so it must be orientated in analyzing and disrupting power. Um, comprehensive and coherent. This recognizes that uh, advances in one area of feminist foreign policy can actually be undermined in another. So we need coherence across domestic and foreign policy decision. Um, you also see in number six to promote a non-violence and demilitarization. So policies and programs that, uh, that should not exacerbate conflict or place civilian population at risk. And that, you know, they should not use violence as a tool to achieve policy outcomes, for example, through widespread sanction against entire population. And then number seven, um, a self-scrutiny and accountability to civil society and those on the receiving end of foreign policy was identified uh, as both as a principle, but also as a mechanism for ensuring implementation. That's which kind of leads me to speak to those three uh, accountability mechanisms that you can see also on that slide there. So, you know, from uh, human financial and legal resourcing and processes, like transparent and inclusive planning and reporting, the workshop also identified the idea of transparent misalignment. And what that means is, you know, we live in an imperfect world, all policy decision will have some trade-off and uh, it will take time, maybe years, to fully implement a feminist approach. So transparent misalignment uh, was proposed and thought of as a way to ensure accountability uh, on this journey. Um, I will add a couple of things uh, to this slide and we can, uh, we can remove the slide now. I'll just, I'll just speak to the couple of additional points that 
since this workshop in 2019, uh, we've also identified a few more principles. So the first is that feminist foreign policy is a framework which can help break down hierarchies and, and find continuum. Uh, an example of that is the breakdown of hierarchies between state security and human security. So we can see investing in human security as a way to advance um, the overall security of states. Uh, and on the other side, we can actually critique approaches which sacrifice human security, people's basic needs and everyday safety in the name of state security. So that's an additional uh, principle. What we also um, uh, you know, have come to crystallize is that a feminist foreign policy breaks down the hierarchies of knowledge. It revalues different ways of knowing and seeing the world. Again, this is critical in the context of climate change, where the dominant worldview of extractive capitalism is doing so much damage. And so we need to revalue indigenous worldviews and approaches. And we will dig into that into our session and with our panel today. Uh, another key uh, principle that has also emerged since this work in 2019 is that gender equality is actually the outcome and feminism here is the approach or the process. So feminist foreign policy isn't or shouldn't be something that you do to others. For a country adopting feminist foreign policy, it's a methodology to guide their own priorities and approach. And that might mean not using the word feminism or the word feminist in every single context, particularly in parts of the world where um, it has a neo-colonial connotation. And actually we'll look forward to unpacking that, um, that particular point with the panel uh, as well today. So I'm going to pause there, um, give you some context and some framing from the work that AWDA has done. I'll now, uh, before we go to the panel, I'll now hand over to my colleague um, Priyanka uh, at the Kubernetes Initiative, uh, who will share the work that Kubernetes has done on uh, analyzing different approaches to feminist foreign policy and gender mainstreaming. Priyanka, over to you. Thank you very much, Bettina. And I must confess that uh, we at Kubernetes Initiative have uh, relied very much on the fantastic work being done by IWDA and uh, ICRW to build some of our research uh, over here as well. So I will just go over um, where we were coming uh, uh, from in our approach to the feminist foreign policy and what we have learned from our conversations and research uh, in India, so the Indian perspective. Um, so essentially when we tuned into the global feminist foreign policy conversation almost now three years ago, uh, there, was no con there was no conversation happening in the Indian policy circles. This term was very new. What we found most interesting uh, about the idea of a feminist foreign policy, which Bettina has already touched upon, was that it was transforming the decision making structures, making it uh, taking an intersectional approach and uh, including more diverse voices. It was also considering the human impact of policies, uh, of foreign policies in diverse areas, including uh, not just uh, humanitarian aid, but also uh, the environment, climate change, health, etc. We also found interesting, as Bettina has again mentioned, that the countries adopting such an approach were taking their own trajectories. They were deciding uh, what the term would mean, what the concept would mean, uh, and how it would play out uh, in within their own uh, national context. Uh, so, for example, if we see the Swede Sweden, who was the first country to announce such a policy, uh, they structured their feminist foreign policy around the three R's, rights, representation, and resources. And a lot of their work was building on the women and peace, women, peace and security work that uh, they had been doing for several years. They also now have a feminist trade policy where through greater analysis data and engaging with gender experts, um, they are looking at how trade agreements may benefit both men and women equally. Uh, uh, Canada, in their, they have a feminist international assistance policy uh, that is, to use the term feminist itself, they went through, as we understood through our conversations, uh, an intensive consultative process to then come to the decision of using the term feminist. Uh, Mexico uses the term feminist to spur affirmative action 
uh, which they use in their external policy, but also then trying to connect it to some of their internal uh, policies as well. And this inter integrating your external policy with the internal policy is a theme that several countries we found um, have tried to tackle in various ways. One of them is to have uh, either an office or, or, or uh, an entity that, that looks at policies across ministries, both internal and external, to ensure that there's this gender lens. Uh, Sweden, France, and Denmark has such uh, an office or entity. Um, Germany was another very interesting example for us because they began with using the term gender uh, and only in the end of 2021 have they announced a feminist foreign policy. Uh, so these different trajectories were of course very uh, interesting to us, but we also noticed in all of that, that this, the conversation was largely taking place in the, in the transatlantic space. Um, and there, weren't, there wasn't a lot of discussion happening in this side of the world. So what we try to do through our work was to, um, to widen these circles of conversation, to uh, engage with uh, the po foreign policy ecosystem, as well um, as the organizations working on gender within India, to understand what, uh, what the perspective would be from India. Uh, we also conducted a fair amount of research to before we began these consultations. And it was very encouraging for us to see that there was evidence of gender considerations in India's external action already uh, in, their humanitarian, in our humanitarian aid, development partnerships, and multilateral engagements. Uh, so, for example, we established the International Solar Alliance along with France in 2015, where the business models developed uh, had a gender consideration. We established the Coalition for Disaster Resilient Infrastructure in 2019 and have drawn a comprehensive national plan to fully achieve the Sendai framework for disaster risk reduction by 2030. And the Sendai framework, as we all know, uh, emphasizes the role of women in managing, designing, resourcing, and implementing effective plans and programs. The Indian Technical and Economic Cooperation Program, which has been in existence since 1964, um, has conducted several trainings, um, given grants, scholarships over the years that have uh, benefited women uh, all over the world. For example, they have had the very successful Solar Grandmothers program through which um, solar grandmothers in, in remote areas uh, are trained to look after the solar, solar panels and uh, structures that exist there. So basic engineering training so that they might manage uh, the solar energy uh, within their, their villages. Um, India also deployed the first ever all-female police unit to the United Nations mission in Liberia in 2007, followed by units to UN missions in the Democratic Republic of the Congo and Republic of South Sudan. Uh, so all of this was very encouraging to us. Uh, it made us realize that we didn't have to start from scratch and we already had um, spaces where then India could build on uh, having such a gender mainstreaming policy. Uh, but through our uh, consultations, we heard very strongly uh, something again that Bettina has touched upon, uh, the reservation for the word feminist. Uh, because in, 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 the, in our context, it's very often uh, associated with a very Western term um, or something that is that that relates to very radical activism. Uh, and so there was some reservation on using the term feminist uh, for, for such a policy if when it may take place. Um, and of course, there was a need to take a more intersectional approach where you're looking at gender, not just in terms uh, of the binaries, but also taking into account considerations that are important uh, from the Indian perspective, uh, such as caste, a class, religion, et cetera. So we are still, this is a work in progress and we are still having these conversations and, um, and, and developing what may be an Indian perspective and, and where we may go from here and how long it would take. Uh, and I'm very excited now to uh, give back uh, the anchoring of this uh, of event to Bettina and hear from the wonderful panelists that we have today. Thank you so much, Priyanka. Um, so I will introduce our panelists uh, now and, and then we will go into some questions I mentioned earlier. So um, Shahania Sekaram is an independent policy and advocacy consultant in gender, 
Based in Colombo, Sri Lanka, she's currently focused on gender-based violence, resourcing women and girls-led organization, and gender issues in humanitarian and emergency contexts, including with the Coalition of Feminists for Social Change as their advocacy communication consultant, and also with Voice as their regional technical lead um, for South Asia. We also have Chandi uh, Eng, um, he's the executive director of GATSI, the Gender and Development, uh, gender and Development for Cambodia, a Cambodian nonprofit organization focused on gender equality as human rights. Chandi manages GATSI's work on leadership networks, campaign, publication, fundraising, and public forums to raise awareness on gender equality issues and lobbies national level legislators and policymakers to incorporate gender principles into new and existing laws and policy. Nalini Singh is a feminist and a social development specialist with over 20 years experience in design, implementation, management, monitoring and evaluation of women's rights and development program in Asia Pacific. Um, with her patient passion for women's human rights and gender equality driving her work, her particular interest uh, is in the issues of women's sexual and reproductive health and rights, decent work and organizational capacity strengthening. Um, and then finally, James Blackwell um, is a pr proud uh, Wira Jury man and research fellow in indigenous diplomacies at the ANU Coral Bell School of uh, Asia Pacific, Pacific Affairs. His work centers on conceptualizing First Nation foreign policy approaches in the 21st century, as well as the greater inclusion of First Nation voices with governance system. So thank you so much for joining us, uh, panelists. I will uh, go to Shariana first. Um, and that's because we, well, we've talked earlier about the connection between gender and peace. Uh, and you've written about the importance of feminist foreign policy in post-conflict context uh, like Sri Lanka and the way that women who um, experience freedom from uh, gender norms during conflict have actually been put back into these rigid roles in the post-conflict rehabil rehabilitation process. So could you um, tell us about this and how you think a feminist approach could change the way um, we approach peace building? Thank you so much, uh, Bettina, and it's an absolute pleasure. Thank you for having me here um, today. Um, so I think there are two kind of key points I want to make um, in response to your question, which I think will help sort of also frame some of these conversations we're having um, around the importance of feminist foreign policy, particularly in a conflict setting. The first is that ooh, a sort of Perhaps I should call it this, a personal frustration of mine is often how watered down the idea of feminism has become uh, in a very sort of pop culture era. Uh, and it's been reduced down to, oh, feminism is about equality, which is sort of like saying the ocean is water that's wet. You know, it's true, but it does not capture the vastness, the breadthness and the nuance that, you know, is necessary to understand what being feminist and what taking a feminist approach means. So I wanna start there, which is to say that to be feminist also is to address, not just look at issues on an individual scale, but to address systemic, structural and institutional equality, inequality uh, and how that manifests. So that's the first point I wanna make about feminist foreign policy and its importance is that it recognizes where system structures and institutions have perpetrated inequality, perpetrated violence, oppression, and doesn't reduce it down to a generational, even one generation of, of solving problems, right? It takes such a long-term deconstruction, deconstructing and reconstructing approach. Um, the second point I want to make kind of brings in from that, and, and most, you know, I, I'm going to use the example of Sri Lanka to kind of underlie um, what I'm talking about, is that as you said, in conflict, what happens is, is everything becomes upended, right? And conflict also is born out of systemic oppression and violence. That is often where the roots of conflict come from. So when we apply a feminist foreign policy approach, we are able to recognize those two very fundamental underpinnings. And now in Sri Lanka, for example, as you said, what happened post-conflict was that women, particularly women who had joined the conflict um, as rebel fighters, in, and I'm speaking specifically also about, um, about the LTT, 
many of them joined in order to escape the rigid gender roles that they were subject to um, within their community. So they were joining not only because they believed in the cause, but they also, as women, wanted to break free from being wives, daughters, mothers, and these fit roles. So when you go and put them right back into those roles, you're not actually addressing why they joined in the first place. You're not understanding that men and women have different reasons for joining and different reasons for being a part. You're treating everybody as this homogeneous group. And that's the beauty also of bringing a feminist approach. As you said, it's an intersectional approach. Feminism is intersectional. And we recognize that our identities don't operate in silos, they exist together. So how do you stop treating people and groups as homogeneous and begin to unpack the layers and nuance? And for me, those are really the two fundamental underpinnings that a feminist foreign policy approach brings that other approaches haven't and, and, and fail to address. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sharanya. And I think you know, you're touching on, uh, we talked earlier about hierarchies of knowledge, different ways of seeing the world. And so, you know, part of a, and so James, I will come to you here because part of a feminist foreign policy approach is breaking down hierarchies of knowledge and your work focuses on First Nation approaches to foreign policy. Um, can you explain to us what this looks like and why, why it's important to include as part of a feminist foreign policy and both generally, but also for First Nation communities? Yeah, thanks, Bettina. And also, you know, thanks for having me here at this uh, event. Just want to acknowledge also I'm coming from Ngunnawal country here in Canberra and just, you know, respect their ancestors and elders um, here. Uh, yeah, look, I think including First Nations pe people within foreign policy, at least within Australia, and that's kind of what I'm speaking to here, because every country that has kind of a First Nations population or, or, or an Indigenous population has a unique story, a unique experience, and a kind of unique relationship with those First Nations. So I, I don't want to kind of speak beyond the Australian context. But if we're looking at Australia, you know, we've often suffered a lot of exclusion with, with, with regards to policy and not really sort of been brought in on issues that affect us. You know, if you're talking about climate change, for example, you know, First Nations groups in this country are more likely to be affected by uh, the changing climate and the kind of effects that that has on, on our environment, our economy, our society. If you look at, if, and if you look at, you know, other issues of foreign policy, whether that be, you know, the US Army bases in, in Northern Australia, which are, you know, quite close to in, Indigenous communities and, and other such areas of foreign policy, more often than not, they tend to impact First Nations to a greater degree than I think most people give, give credit to. And so an inclusion aspect is both about kind of bringing us to the table to, to, to talk as, as equal stakeholders in the, in, the, in the system, but it's also about kind of you know, foregrounding our, our knowledge and expertise and the kind of different ways of knowing and doing things that we have here, at least in, in, in this country, you know, for over 60,000 years. And so, you know, there, we have unique perspectives and unique ways of doing things that can bring benefit to foreign policy and can bring benefit to a country's foreign policy. So to include that both benefits the country that's doing it, in this case, Australia, but also benefits our own communities by giving us a say over our own affairs. Now, you know, in terms of feminist foreign policy, you know, you, you talked earlier around you know, intersectionality and kind of, you know, bringing in other, other marginalizations and other marginalized groups into that discussion, you know, First Nations in, in this country are sort of one of the key marginalized groups here in, in terms of the history that we've had, um, you know, with dispossession and discrimination and racism and, and exclusion, as I, as I talked about. So I think that's kind of, you know, if we are to have a feminist foreign policy approach, at least in Australia, you can't really do that without including the voices of First Nations women who have often been arguing and fighting on these issues for a lot longer and haven't been acknowledged or thanked or even recognised in the same way. So, you know, to really have that inclusive feminist approach that does try and transform structures of power and change structures of power, doing that involves, doing that involves bringing First Nations to the table and sort of including us in that discussion, in that dialogue, in that design of policy, to truly kind of change the way that we're thinking about how policy looks, but also how policy is implemented and thought about and discussed in the kind of societal debates around these issues. So I think, yeah, it's, it's important both for the country, obviously, and for my community, because we, we want to say over our own affairs, you know, we want to have that involvement in policy because it, it does impact us. But we also want to see 
a transformed, you know, way of doing things in this country, whether it be, you know, we can talk about the order of statement from the heart and a voice to parliament and what kind of structural change that brings and why that's important and why my community very strongly wants that kind of change. But, you know, that kind of links into that kind of argument with the feminist foreign policy approach of, you know, we want to change these structures to really benefit people in a way that the current systems aren't doing. And in order to do that, we really do need to be integrating what, you know, what 60, 80,000 years of First Nations history in this country has really brought to the table, but it doesn't get the kind of airtime or focus or even attention or respect, you know, that, that other approaches get. I, th I think the, the respect there is the big issue, you know, you can, you can talk about how and how they're mentioned, but I think it's about respecting them as equal, respecting First Nations as equal partners in the discussion, but also respecting our approaches and our, ont and our ontologies and epistemologies as equal, as equally valid in the political system, in the foreign policy system. And I think a feminist foreign policy approach that does include First Nations is the kind of one that is going to most radically and most substantively change structures of power in this country, I think, around not, not just foreign policy, but around kind of all areas of policy that, that involve First Nations. Uh, and I think I'll kind of leave that there. Sorry, I talked really quickly, so I think I've just got to whiz through that. <laughs> Thank you, James. I'm sure I'm going to come back to you. I think we'll, you know, also you're drawing the link uh, between the connecting the domestic and the international policy frameworks. And so I will go to, to Nalini on this because a feminist foreign policy actually uh, enables that connection between the domestic and the international policies. And this is an important issue, um, particularly important on issues like climate change, where the domestic inaction of countries like Australia are actually undermining relationships in the region, um, including obviously in the Pacific. So, so Nalini, how do you see this playing out in the Pacific? Thanks, Martina. Um, lovely to be in this panel and um, a very interesting question indeed. Um, you know, while interactions um, in the region may be somewhat strained with Australia and the Pacific small island states on the issue of climate change, but when it comes to cooperation on strengthening military infrastructure and playing around with geopolitics, then it's all systems ago. And this is exactly what we are seeing this week um, in, in Fiji with the beginnings of a big military complex being set up in Fiji called BlackRock. The irony of it all. So I, I have three points, and that was my first one. The fact that, um, you know, uh, with climate change, there's a lot of conflict and a lot of discussions. But when it comes to, yeah, as, as mentioned earlier, you're talking about military infrastructure, talking about the way geopolitics plays out, the role of other countries in, in the Pacific, then it's, um, you know, uh, it's a different type of cooperation that we see. Second would be, we have to remember that the Pacific small island states, you know, what have we been saying uh, over, you know, many years in terms of the slow and rapid impacts of climate change that we are facing um, from frequent, more devastating cyclones from which we are, you know, unable to recover from uh, and we get hit by another one to complete inundation of some islands. You know, we have, you know, such an escalation in the loss of species, whether it is um, marine species or uh, those on land. You know, we are losing our medicinal plants. We are losing um, plants that we use to create artifacts, traditional artifacts. We are losing, um, you know, uh, food. We are seeing invasion from uh, other species coming in. And, um, you know, what does that mean? You know, it means that, um, the loss and damage that we are facing right now, both economic and non-economic. And economic is uh, you know, easy to understand you know, in terms of the damage we face from uh, disasters, et cetera. And you know, what we uh, put up in terms of um, adaptation measures with sea walls and, and all of that. But the non-economic losses, you know, this, this is significant. You know, we're talking about loss of entire cultures, you know, and traditions and knowledge and language and identity um, is very severe. And, you know, and I don't need to repeat it, but I'm gonna say it. And, and this comes at the back of we not being the major contributors to what we are facing. Australia is and continues to be so. Um, so we expect that a feminist foreign policy would be more just to us. And this does not mean um, cherry picking 
on issues to then support uh, when it comes to, uh, you know, um, providing that uh, to the countries in the Pacific. And third would be um, that, you know, climate change has spotlighted um, that the options for space may also be very constrained for us in the, in the Pacific, um, small island states. As many people um, uh, in the Pacific small island states, you know, have or rely on subsistence or semi-subsistence uh, livelihoods, and our national economies, you know, are very narrowly based on one or two industries, you know, either tourism and a heavy reliance on foreign aid from our neighboring countries, and, and this weighs in very heavy in our national budgets. Um, and perhaps the largest contributions are from Australia. Not to say that we are not thankful and grateful for the attention, because if that was not the case, then in the last two years, we've been, you know, our economies have been ravaged by COVID, you know, what would have happened uh, to the people, you know, so we're thankful for that. But, you know, at the same time, you know, the Pacific is lagging behind um, in almost all the gender equality indicators. Now we have very high rates of gender-based violence. We have increasing poverty, worsening health outcomes for, for uh, all, including, and, and more so for women, when speaking about sexual and reproductive health and rights. We have you know, a decrease in the quality of education, we have a decrease in the quality of employment. Um, that also relates to you know, ways of social security for um, people. And as, as a region, you know, we are at the lowest rank for IPU in terms of women in leadership. You know, Australia has and is a major donor for uh, initiatives for gender equality. And you know, like I said before, we are very grateful for that um, because, you know, we are fighting a major battle, you know, whether it is um, looking at, um, you know, at the individual level and also, you know, at the structural levels as well. And so, um, but, you know, we say at the same time that that support should not come um, from Australia, you know, having its own uh, agendas and responsibilities to the climate change commitments, which at the moment is quite minimal given what we are facing as a region in terms of the impacts of, from climate change. And with Fiji, um, you know, like I said, we are grateful for all the budget support we have received. We have received general budget support, but the question remains, and I'm going to end here, Bettina, where has that gone? You know, with no systems for checks and balances and accountability and interaction, we don't know. Mm. Thank you, Nalini. I'm going to come back to you on those issues of transparency and accountability, because that is uh, also a key tenant of uh, principles of feminist foreign policy. I'm going to go uh, to the role of civil society organization and to you, Chandy. Um, and, and in that context, um, you know, just, just framing that question, you know, something that we see in feminist foreign policy literature is that while commitment uh, come from governments, civil society organizations play a key role in creating a, a soft landing ground for these announcements by raising awareness of the issues and campaigning for actions on gender equality. Um, so, you know, from your Cambodian perspective and knowing uh, the work you're doing with ASEAN, you know, could you could you tell us about um, about that work that you're doing with the ASEAN Women's Caucus to build awareness of feminist foreign policy? Thank you so much, Bedina, and uh, good afternoon from Cambodia to all panelists and also uh, participants. Before going to answer the, the question about uh, what like the role of the CSO in ASEAN as well as in Cambodia have, have done um, with the family foreign policy, I would like to flick again with the definition that shared by Batina earlier regarding family foreign policy. Like feminist foreign policy is an approach which places gender equality as a central goal of foreign policy in recognition that gender equality is a predictor to peaceful and flourishing society. I'm not sure how many um, participants in, in, in our session today have heard about your own country foreign policy or those who are coming from ASEAN, like Southeast Asia nations, have heard about the, the foreign policy in ASEAN in, in general. If you have heard about this, um, I, I would love to hear more from you so you can just put some of the idea in the chat so that we can learn more together. So answering to the question regarding the role right now um, of uh, uh, civil society in ASEAN. So 
the Southeast Asia nation is, is one of the old uh, regional um, platform that consists of 10 countries. And right now, the Moleste is trying to be in. So as us in the, uh, in the civil society uh, platform, we include uh, the Moleste in our advocacy in, in general. We normally always look at the inequality, like the difference between poor or the rich in our own country. But we normally abandon the idea of comparing between um, um, the, 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 the inequality between state, like, you know, like while inequality between rich and poor has been subject to the global attention, to our attention, but inequality between countries has also continued to, to um, with just only little attention. Somehow uh, it's connect with our life. For example, if two countries have a discussion regarding economic together, they might only thinking about the development, but is the inclusive development is in their discussion, we don't know about it. And um, this is why feminist foreign policy is very important. Talking about ASEAN, there is no such thing calling feminist foreign policy or even foreign policy in one piece yet. Um, we put the word, we call it like blueprint as the reason of ASEAN for 10 years, like 2015 until 2020, 25. Um, um, in, in that case, uh, in 2015, the state of ASEAN, they created the vision, 10 year vision, that only focusing on economic, not more than that, like not much more than like economics. So a group of, of, of women representative, um, I, I think you have heard about them, uh, if, I, if I say their name, like APWLD, like IRO as the Pacific, Arrow and South, Southeast Asia Women Caucus on ASEAN, they submitted the reason, like the 10 year reason of ASEAN, more than what the government is doing, is called ASEAN Women's Blueprints for Alternative Regionalism. In that blueprints, we mainstream the principle about feminist foreign policy that uh, Bettina uh, showed us earlier. So those, those are the things that we come together to, to promote for that. But unfortunately, the, the government of um, the ASEAN state has not really put much attention to that um, submission from the uh, Southeast Asia Women Caucus on ASEAN. However, it has been like eight years already uh, to the 2025. Um, we have not seen much progress about equality. In the blueprint, we mentioned a lot about addressing inequality, climate justice, um, economic, social, and, and um, cultural movement, and also um, uh, accountability and transparency of the work that ASEAN state should do to address gender equality in, into the ASEAN state. So um, I would stop from here, but um, I would leave uh, questions for all of us discussing, uh, maybe among uh, all participants as well, regarding what kind of uh, feminist foreign policy that you can see have been happening or the principle that have been happening into your country or, or even in your region. Thank mm -hmm. you. Thank you, Chandy. And thank you for putting that call to the audience. And just before I go back to, um, to other panelists, a uh, uh, good opportunity to say, please make sure you put your questions as they come to you in the chat and then we'll come back to, to them um, uh, shortly. Uh, so Nelly, you've touched on it. Jenny, you've just touched on it. So now I'm coming back to you on the on that question of transparency and accountability, because it's um, you know the importance of inclusive, transparent, and accountable policy making in the context of feminist foreign policy is obviously critical. What do you think Australia's approach to the Pacific would need to look like under our feminist foreign policy? That that definitely uh, you know opens up. Um... Uh, sort of a wish list, but I, I will constrain myself to just a few points that um, I've been able to think of. Um, and first one would be certainly not a big brother approach, um, because uh, you know when it comes to the larger issues under discussion around climate change and even you know looking at the geopolitics, um, that's the approach that um, you know comes uh, forward. And so we are hoping certainly it's not that. Second would be uh, not an approach that dictates terms, but works in, uh, in a much more consultative and collaborative way. So ensuring that given the lack of understanding of gender issues, the entire region needs to work together 
to help each other out. Um, because that is a fundamental gap that um, there is no, um, uh, should I say, um, um, leveraging or, you know, um, you know, no way to say that there is an understanding in terms of the gender issues or being gender sensitive, um, you know, uh, in the ways in which we work. So, you know, um, if we are collaborative and consultative, then there has to be pathways of developing plans that will help the region understand and move forward to improve on all the gender, uh, you know, equality indicators that we are really um, not doing well. Um, uh, and, um, uh, you know, as we said, you know, women need to be on the, on the table. And so uh, with this approach, we think, you know, um, they can be put on the table. Um, one other is that, uh, uh, you know, mainstreaming gender in a transformative way, you know, so that it's just not lip service. Um, and there's a way, you know, ensured ways that, you um, uh, you know, what I was saying earlier that, you know, when we, where we have lack of understanding of gender issues, you know, um, lack of uh, gender sensitization, then the entire region must come together to understand it. I mean, there are opportunities. The region remarkably has a declaration on gender equality. The Pacific Islands Forum has a declaration, which is undergoing a review process. But what does that mean beyond that piece of paper? You know, the review process, uh, I think, has picked up you know, that, uh, you know, quite well, but what does it mean? And herein, we can see that if Australia does move towards it, then that's an opportunity, um, given that it is one of the major donors um, in the region for gender equality. And next would be, you know, to get away from the gatekeeping attitude and culture that we sometimes see and be more inclusive, you know, as James was saying, have, um, you know, indigenous people, um, uh, and everybody, you know, women living with disabilities, young women, women in all the diversities present um, on, on the table, because it's this very people that their lives matter. And we are the ones that, you know, um, should be working towards that and removing any of obstacles that prevents their participation. Um, next would be um, to walk the talk, you know, start from within, as Bettina, you were saying, um, you know, and then demonstrate how it can be done with other country partners. So walking the talk becomes very important. And I think um, in the immediate, as we are seeing with how the climate change discussions and negotiations around commitments uh, is, is going, that's definitely not it. So um, again, you know, we cannot have cherry picking of issues, but, um, you know, we have to all be together in it for um, the policy to work for everyone. Next would be um, to look at the benefits of having the policy work for all. Um, you know, women must be, you know, at the consultation tables, at the decision-making tables in meaningful ways. And for that, we must um, improve on um, you know, the representation of women in all different types of decision-making um, spheres. And it's unfortunate that we are at the lowest rung of the IPU um, ranking when it comes to that, but we have some improvement with Samoa, New Zealand, and uh, you know I'm hoping for you know more um, uh, women in decision making places in other countries. And finally, I have to say, um, yes, I agree with you, Bettina, to have robust accountability mechanisms where people are able to engage with all the processes. Um, and, you know, um, have whistleblowing elements and, and remove the fear and, and intimidation that, you know, um, can stop that uh, from happening when it comes to actually questioning where is bilateral aid support going or, you know, questioning the motives behind certain decisions or actions. So I would have to say um, we have to have it uh, as a people-centered approach. We must have it as with a human rights-based approach and with you know uh, everyone, including women, um, uh, present. Thank you, Nelanie, and you're you're getting uh, comments of support in the chat. I think I want to pick up on uh, you mentioned this, um, you know, the inclusive uh, inclusiveness being key, and and as you said, James touched on that earlier, and we're really actually talking about transformative uh, agenda here. 
And so, yeah, transformation, not just, um, James, I'm, I'm going to come to you, not just fitting individual women or marginalized group into existing power structures, but actually transforming those um, structures entirely. What are the priorities for you in transforming Australia's approach to foreign policy in line with First Nation worldviews? Thanks, Katina. Yeah, look, I mean, so, I mean, the first thing is to not do what you just said, which was, you know, put various individuals in certain positions and, and think that is, is enough. I think, you know, we've seen a lot of that here in Australia with regards to First Nations peoples, and we've seen that it doesn't really work. I think the first thing we kind of need to do with regards to foreign policy is to first work out what it is that First Nations communities actually want. Like, what is it that what is it that we're looking for? What are what is it that our values are in this system? What is it that we're looking to get? And you know, I, I can speculate on that. You know, other academics in in my field and, and other fields have speculate on that. But I think to really work that out, we do need to kind of go back to community, go back to our our communities, and kind of you know do the research, do the work, and work out work out what what it is that we're looking for as communities. Because, you know, if you, to give some space, a specific example here, you know, the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade has an Indigenous Diplomacy Agenda, which speaks to, you know, benefit of First, First Nations people, but they don't necessarily define benefit and they've not actually asked First Nations what that benefit means. So when we're talking about, you know, what First Nations want, we really kind of need to work out and ask us, you know, what is it that you're looking for? What is it that, what, what, what transformations do our communities want to see? I think, you know, once we then work that out, then we can kind of go about the process of developing those and, and changing those around. But I think the first step, and the first step, I think, in any any policy with, with regards to First Nations is, is around, you know, involving us in a way that we do feel heard and seen and on an equal footing. I think that, that's another key thing, you know, a colleague of mine, Julie Bellangari, talks about this around, you know, we have to come to the table on an, on an equal footing and kind of have the same structural levels of power that that the government has not be sort of tokenized in the way that government currently, currently tokenizes us. I think the second thing is around, you know, treating us as, as uh, significant players in the system. I think that, that's the other part of the transformation beyond just working out what it is that we want, also engaging with us as equal players. I think, you know, I touched upon this in the, in the, you know, earlier in the, in the session about how, you know, we kind of need to be respected and acknowledged that our perspectives and our values are on an equal footing and are worth considering. And I think that's, you know, one of the things that we most want to see within transformation and kind of efforts of transformation is how is it that not only, you know, are they, are they listening to what, what we want, but are they engaging with us in a way that, that, that is respectful and that is productive? You know, that's not kind of tokenizing our, our views, not kind of pigeonholing us into, oh, you know, that, that's the kind of, I think we have a tendency in Australia to kind of pigeonhole First Nations into the kind of, the black box, the kind of First Nations box, where that's the kind of little playground we get to play in, and any policy outside of what the government deems important is not really treated serious. I think if we are to engage First Nations on, on, on First Nations terms, we kind of need to go and take a holistic approach to policy and go, what is it across the board that we're looking to do? Not, not just what is it in the First Nations rights area, because you know, in Australia, First Nations have been involved very heavily in discussions on First Nations rights and you know human rights and legal legal frameworks around around UNDRIP and things, we have been heavily involved in that. But beyond that immediate area, we are not necessarily heavily involved. And so it's about that part of that respect, part of that kind of equal footing engagement is around going, okay, what is it beyond that we can do? What is it beyond this kind of little circle that we've drawn? And part of that is, you know, engaging us on our own terms. And again, that links back, it's, it's very circular, but, you know, kind of links back to, you know, first we need, need, need to work out what First Nations want, then we need to actually treat that seriously rather than just, just you know, I, I have a thousand reports on this shelf here behind me on different attempts government has made to engage us that doesn't get read, doesn't get enacted. So it's about first, you know, we have to engage First Nations, but we also have to actually do the work and treat that engagement seriously and treat the outcomes of that seriously. And what that process looks like, I think, is up for debate and discussion and amongst my own community, amongst the policy community. But I think the first step is, you know, we kind of need to need, need, need to get a voice. And obviously I'm going to plug the older from the heart again in terms of how that might be, how that might be achieved. But again, you know, it's the kind of thing of the first step is a voice. And then we can kind of move on to the structural transformation. And the kind of actual change there. I think I'll, I'll leave that there. I hope that answers the question. Yes, thank you, James. And, and I think when you're talking about holistic approach, my mind also goes to 
the principles around intersectionality. And so I want to I want to go to Shahania because it is clear that intersectionality is a core principle um, that's coming through the thread of conversation today and a core principle to, to feminist um, prime policy approaches. So Shahina, how um, Shahania, how do you how would you um, how would this impact the way um, feminist foreign policy should be implemented in South Sister. I know in a South Asian context, you know, having that intersectionality lens. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm just reflecting so deeply on so many of the things that have been said, which have been so important and really provided a, such a strong frame for us to understand uh, how, you know, the realities of what foreign, feminist foreign policy approaches can mean. Uh, not just at high level policy meetings, but really on the ground, right? For communities um, who face the brunt and the impact of this. Um, and one example I want to give is that, you know, when we talk about intersectionality, so it, it's important to remember a lot of these terms come out of academia, right? And they come out of Western academia, which mm -hmm. means that sometimes the way they are framed doesn't always make sense for regions outside of the global north. Um, and now, for example, in South Asia, a big part of intersectionality actually has less to do with race and more to do with caste and class. Something that's not always factored in uh, when we talk about conflict or when we talk about aid or when we talk about how approaches need to be made. Uh, and I think this is exactly where the impact of intersectionality and the impact of having a con uh, an approach that's rooted in a local and regional context matters. Um, because that's exactly what we need to stop doing, right? We need to stop copy pasting approach. I think Jim said it really well when he was very specific about the fact that this is an Australian context, that it's a unique framework, it's a unique experience, which it, which is, it is for so many other regions as well. Um, I mean, even the experiences of native and indigenous people vastly vary um, from region to region, um, you know, and for example, in countries like India and in Sri Lanka, you're looking at the Adivasi people whose, whose persecu persecution has not been the same as it has been in countries like Australia and, and, and the United States. And so I think that's a part of the intersectionality is to make sure that it's rooted in that local and regional context. And that we're not simply picking up and copy pasting what has, you know, a frame that doesn't, that belongs to a different um, context entirely. Uh, and then the last thing I wanted to say on this is, it's also important, you know, in, in regions like South Asia to understand that how much language plays a role. Uh, and I think that is a part of, I know there was a, there was a uh, I noticed a comment in the chat which talked about the difficulty of translating the idea of feminist or the word feminist um, into, you know, different languages. Mm -hmm. And I think, and, you know, something I want to say there is the problem is that we're often trying to translate words instead of ideas and concepts. And for me, realizing that what we need to be doing is trying to be communicating the concept and the idea instead of getting really hung up on a word that needs to be used makes a world of difference in how we communicate this. Mm. Um, and that is a part of intersectionality also, right? It's understanding that, you know, how the region of South Asia works is, I remember having conversations about COVID language uh, with the uh, members of Chittagong Hill Tracks communities in Bangladesh who are saying, well, we don't even speak Bangla to begin with, even though everyone's translating in Bangla. And then what Bangla is translated that we can understand is very academic, very high front because it's coming from some like fancy university. You know, so I think it's also about these really, really small things that we just need to go back, rework and come at it from a local contextualized approach as opposed to a very high level um, sort of umbrella approach. Yeah. Thank you very much. I, actually, I think that's very helpful point to be raising, and particularly as I, I want to go to Chandy and talk about feminist leadership because um, you're raising the issue of language, the language issues of naming uh, versus uh, or and uh, the issue of practice. So you know there is a common misconception that feminism or feminist foreign policy, for that matter, is just about. Um, women holding leadership roles uh, in this context of the conversation today in the foreign policy space, when actually what we need to see is feminist leadership. So Gatsi, you know, has really been putting feminist leadership into practice. Uh, we really keen to hear, Chandy, 
your experience of that? Like, can you tell us about your experience of this approach to feminist leadership? Thank you, Bettina. Um, well, talking about feminist leadership in, in my own organization, um, we, we used to be mocked by uh, many other patriarchy institutions who hold that power um, for a very long time. When we, we told them that we are practicing feminist um, leadership in our organization, um, meaning that we are encouraging for equal play and, and also um, sharing equal power and uh, uh, focusing on the power dynamic into the room that we are working, then um, they asked us like, do you call it like equality when your management team is like 80% female and 20% and males? And then, <laughs> and then uh, we like sit down for around like two hours uh, discussing about it. And um, it, is, it is the way like one word to sum up, it's transforming the status quo that people always believe that men should be the one in the position all, all the times. Like why you are not questioning the institution that have so many men, like more than 80% of men in our parliamentary and only 20% are female, you do not even question it, but you, you question our organization that are uh, trying to transform that such uh, uh, status quo. So I think um, this kind of challenging happen everywhere for us who are working for gender equality and gender democracy in, in, in our space. So one the example that we, we are working in our organization, we just would like to express that the family leadership is not um, putting aside of anyone. We, we include everyone. We do not leave anyone behind. And, and in our organization, we also have the uh, network called Men Engagement Network, making sure that men understand about their role and also um, their participations to end violence against women and girls and how can we work together to um, achieve uh, gender equality. So in the family leadership, um, uh, we want to make like power dynamic more transparent. And um, it's, it's always to answer the question, like how we recognize power in, in the room, um, like how we know when it is projected into us in our role, and most important of all, how, how we utilize projected power to serve the purpose of our work and the mission of the organization. So this is, this is some kind of like question that we put in, in um, discussing and also uh, keep checking about the accountability and transparency of using our power in, in, uh, in the family's leadership organization. So this is just uh, some kind of like very short example of us using a family leadership approach in our organization. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Shani. Um, we do have, uh, I do have one question in um, a couple of questions now that have come into the Q&A. So I will go to that and, and turn to, um, to the panel. Uh, the first one I have here is, um, how can feminist foreign policy connect with COVID-19 foreign policy um, to address the disproportionate impact of the pandemic on women in the Pacific? Shall I go to Nalini first? Uh, yes, I think all that um, that I mentioned are, you know, uh, relevant for this as well. Um, however, what we see, you know, in terms of uh, the impact COVID-19 has had on our economies, it's been disproportionate. Um, you know, there have been some countries um, which had, uh, I would say, an earlier onset in terms of, uh, you know, the, the various waves uh, like Fiji. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, we were very fortunate to have, um, uh, you know, the kind of assistance Australia provided to Fiji in terms of uh, supplying um, vaccines. Uh, because um, that was you know, seen as the um, you know, only way out of our situation. Um, and because of our economy that was really suffering with heavy reliance on, on tourism, um, that was seen as a one way through. And with, together with um, uh, extremely, uh, you know, the, the majority of the vaccine supplies we received from Australia, you know, we have had general, general budget support. Um, from 
the Australian government uh, in terms of the bilateral aid. However, you know, um, that's wherein I think if there was a feminist foreign policy um, in existence, then at least we would have looked at the notions of um, where that budget, general budget support was going. Fiji does, does not have, um, uh, you know, uh, I would say we do have our, our gender policies and action plans and very good initiatives that we are um, embarking on at the moment, you know, um, the uh, we, we are next to Australia in terms of developing our national action plan for the prevention of violence against women and girls. Um, uh, we are um, working with the, all of, um, uh, you know, ministries and agencies approach to ensure that they start um, with the, you know, uh, gender transformation uh, in within their ministries, beginning with gender responsive uh, planning and budgeting, um, you know, and working through making sure that we have data, you know, through perhaps seeing and having our first ever country gender assessment um, out soon, um, and, and a number of other initiatives that, um, uh, you know, has had a lot of support from Australia. So what I'm saying is, um, when we were in the crisis mode with you know, the severe impacts of COVID on our economies um, and the support was coming in, that was great. That was great, uh, but it was more targeted to what was happening in that context. Um, you know, uh, well, one can say that you know, we could not predict the way in which the virus would uh, travel across you know, the region and uh, the impacts it would have. But um, you know, moving on a year on, uh, you know, we could have had many lessons learned uh, and have improved. So that the countries that are now in the throes of experiencing the, the, the variants and the waves like Vanuatu and the Solomons, you know, I'm wondering what kind of assistance they are getting. Um, you know, uh, uh, countries like, you know, Papua New Guinea um, that were almost, um, you know, uh, experiencing uh, really high rates of uh, infection and at the same time, probably SVG. I don't know whether, you know, they've had the same type of attention and assistance. So, um, you know, this disproportionate way of looking at, you know, who, um, is there in your neighborhood and how that help is, is, is coming out, for what reasons, you know, um, and, and is it reaching out to everyone, um, you know, that I think um, uh, would perhaps be looked at if we had a feminist foreign policy in, in Australia. I don't see, um, you know, most of the countries in the Pacific aligning to that anytime soon, but um, that, you know, um, well, those would be some of the, um, I think, um, areas, uh, you know, in which that um, it could have helped if we had one, with Australia at least. Thank you. Thank you, Nalini. Um, I'll go to another questions, which um, for the panelists, you will see in a section called uh, Answered, I just uh, accidentally uh, moved it there. Um, is there greater potential for South-South feminist policy arrangements, given shared experiences, rather than North-South arrangements, which tend to be more paternalistic. Um, can I go to maybe uh, Shahania and Chandi to reflect on this question? Maybe Shahania first, yeah. Thank you, uh, Bettina. I think that's an excellent question and a really, really important point, right, that's being raised because so often, um, there are so many layers to this also to unpack, right? Colonization is such a big layer that we're always so uncomfortable to acknowledge and talk about, but it's a big part of why when we talk about the flow of aid and how foreign policy and, and aid flows come through to our regions, how uncomfortable it can be and the kind of underlying suppressions and oppressions it can bring up. Uh, and yes, absolutely, this, this idea or this concept of South-South um, support as opposed to north-south arrangements, which often, how do I frame it, and you know, sort of reinforces existing power hierarchies, existing geopolitical hierarchies, um, and existing discomforts. But also beyond that, I think it also 
what comes out of South-South arrangements is that many of us have shared histories, we have shared cultures, um, we have shared similarities in where our societies, our structures, and our and our ways of existing and organizing have existed and, and are functioning. And I think that is a big part of relationship building and a, and a big part of support that doesn't often always get acknowledged because our trajectories have been very similar in what we have dealt with and what we continue to deal with. And that's something South South can bring out that North South really is unable to. Mm. Chandy, I'm gonna call on you to add to this. Thank you. I think uh, uh, Sharon, Saranja, she has responded very great already um, to this question. I just would like to add just one point that um, Nalini also mentioned about the differences. So normally we work for the family foreign policy. One of the things that we need to uh, put in mind is res uh, first recognize, respect and respond to the differences. So I know that um, if we have like the South South family foreign policy arrangement, the that idea like can answer like greatly to the issue that happening in into the, the one regions better than like um, if we talk about uh, North or South arrangement. So it's just only the adding. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Chandy. We have one more question, uh, and I'd like to go to actually Priyanka um, from the Cuba 9 initiative to, on, on that question. Um, so I'll read out the question. How do we engage in and push for feminist foreign policies in countries that do not uphold international obligations to gender equality they have already committed to? Are there particular initiatives that need to be normalized, i.e. gender responsive budgeting and mainstreaming, to allow for a pivot towards feminist foreign policy. What are the tools we need as organizations, activists to push for this? You're on mute, Priyanka. Yeah. Thank you, Bettina. Um, I think I will also tie this to uh, your previous question because uh, it's, uh, and also what Sharanya said, um, in, terms of, uh, in terms of having a very, um, country specific context, right? And even within the South, uh, countries come from such diverse uh, contexts. So I think it's important for us to have this um, the civil society uh, engagement with, with within uh, civil society itself, where we uh, understand uh, each other and share these perspectives. Um, and for and and to to start the conversation from within the countries and the existing structures because uh, it's it's very important to uh, for at least and I, I can only speak uh, from from our experience here um, to to be able to work uh, given the existing institutions uh, because there are uh, people already uh, doing good work so it's it's important to kind of understand. Uh, what is already happening and then root your perspective uh, within that that existing system uh, because otherwise then uh, it, it has to be something that is uh, disruptive enough for the system to handle uh, so that would be that would be my take on it thank you Priyanka anyone else from the panel wanted to add to this nope I'm seeing you know okay so I'm going to put um, another question to the panel oh Chandy you did raise your hand yeah, I think um, I, I would like to quote what, what Nalini have mentioned earlier uh, regarding this question also. Um, it, I think it's similar, the, the answer saying like, we all together need to do it. Um, not like individual state that, that already against or cannot fulfill their commitment regarding using the family foreign policy into their uh, gender equality work. Um, so we have to work it together. It means like other state have to be the watch, uh, the one who watch out about it. Every year in the world, there is the universal uh, period review for the state every four years. So each state give the recommendations for other states, but after giving the recommendation already, they just like, huh, it's okay. Um, I already gave my recommendation, you do or not, it, it's none of my business and that's not uh, gonna work. So one of the things that we can do uh, to make sure that the other country is like keeping their promise or commitment on, on the paper um, to work and to implement it in the real implementation, not, uh, not like lip service like, and, and then walk the talk. As Nalini mentions, we need the, the check-in 
from the other state too. So yeah, I think each of us have have uh, that that kind of uh, power to hold each other accountability, not focusing on your country alone, but also to the your, your neighbor and also to the other country too. Yep, thank you. Melanie? Yes, I just wanted to add to the discussion around, um, you know, the the South South and North South. You know, I was I was just thinking in my, um, you know, about um, when you presented uh, the timeline with the number of countries that already have feminist foreign policies, you see the majority is global north or, or they are from global north, and of course it's because that they have you know, their big development uh, aid uh, agencies um, that have been, you know, doing this work for a very long time and, you know, finally realizing that, okay, they need to change in the way. And the fact that this shift is coming from the women's movement, it's coming from the feminist movement, which should never be forgotten. And that is pushing it. Now, this is now linking to another point that I want to make is that imagine, you know, if, in our countries, I'm talking about our global South countries, if people were aware and we had the opportunities to participate, and I know it's not possible um, from India down to my country, Fiji, you know, um, to be, you know, designing um, uh, a policy uh, for um, our countries in this nature. Um, but imagine, you know, if our uh, governments knew that people would back them, um, you know, and support them when they would also at that same table with the Global North donors be there with leveraging power to say, yes, you know, that's very great. You know, you're giving all of this, but, you know, how about considering all the other things that are also on the table? So I'm thinking about, you know, um, in, in, the, in the sense of geopolitics, uh, shifting the power on the table when at that level, you know? So, um, and so in that way, I'm very, very uh, glad to have countries like Mexico and Chile, you know, um, getting on this path because it's important. Um, we see how um, Mexico is in terms of fighting for uh, the, the gender issues when it comes to COP and you know, the commitments that are coming out from COP. And I think, you know, um, a great, um, uh, you know, contribution is from the feminist movement, the women's movement, which is there to support them, to say, we are here as well. You know, it's, it's uh, it, one thing to be sitting as passive recipients on the table and another thing to be, you know, behaving in a way uh, in terms of leveraging that power dynamics a little bit, not, uh, to the detriment in terms of when it comes to looking at power politics entirely, but you know, to ensuring that it's people-centered um, and we, we must keep that there. So I was just thinking around to how, how and you know, what it would mean if more Global South countries start doing this and, and you know, how, what kind of shifts we are going to get into the dead spaces in terms of decision making and negotiations that unfortunately some of our UN spaces have become, how dynamically that could change. And so I see potential, but it is that time frame is going to be very long, in my opinion, uh, if we even start putting the potential countries on it. So that's I, all that I have to say. Thanks, Bettina. Thank you. Thank you, Nellie. So we have nine minutes left. I'm going to put one more question to the whole panel and you will have one minute to, to give your thoughts. Um, you know, a common concern about feminist foreign policy is that the word feminist is seen as a Western construct. We've touched on this uh, in many parts of the region. So while we know that feminist foreign policy should be something that guides a country's own approach rather than something that, you know, is forced upon others, if we're going to see countries in the Indo-Pacific region taking up this approach, it will be important to make it relevant to the context of the region. So my question is, can I ask each of you to share one idea um, for what you would change or what you would add to current feminist um, foreign policy approaches to make them relevant um, to our region? And I don't want to put anyone on the spot, so I'm going to let you jump in. I'll know from unmuting. 
Um, I'm happy to jump in here and say, I think the one thing that has to happen is that it has to be led by women and girl-led organizations and feminist groups from the country. They should be at the center. They should be leading it. Um, the approach is the work. And right down from design of the approach and not just at the implementation stage. Thank you. Uh, if I can jump in, I think just to second that and say it needs to be a, it needs to be led by the unique approaches and uh, you know different cultural different cultural backgrounds of each of, of each country. You know, if, you, if you look at Australia, you want to be including First Nations people. Looking at other countries, you want, want to be making it specific and focused on individual nations and their experiences and what they're looking to get out of it. Yeah, that's what that that's all I'd add. Thank you, James. Um, not so different from gems. Yeah, individually and uh, respect the differences is one of the, the key thing for for that approach too. And just remember that solidarity is not uniformity. Um, we are doing things for the same goal, agenda equality, but we can do it in different method, different ways because we have different culture and also different way to address it. Um, the way that you are doing may not work in, in our regions, but um, it may be a very good example. So we can do it in different ways. So yes, yeah, solidarity is not uniformity for making the feminist current policy approach work in, in each region. Thank you. Maybe I'm going to take the uh, a bit of a drastic approach in here and say, why not? You know, why is there such a visceral reaction to the word feminist, um, you know, when um, it, when you break it down and we have done that, you know, we know what it actually means. Um, so uh, rather than, to me as a feminist, um, it, it, I have to claim the word um, uh, and use it. And I have to, you know, do my best to educate everyone around what that word means and why is it important to have it in there. And, um, uh, I would have to say that, um, you know, but, you know, the, the reactions that we get when we do say the word um, is something that, you know, it will take a bit of time to move across as will these conversations, because we are not expecting such policies to be developed, you know, uh, next year or so. Um, you know, it should take time. And with this is, I see an opportunity to break down all those barriers, you know, to name patriarchy, and to actually break down all the you know structural and innate you know um, barriers that have been in existence for so long. So taking that as an opportunity, uh, I would say I would still stick to the word. Mm. Thank you, Melanie. So look, I think something that stands out um, for me from this discussion is that feminist foreign policy as we said, is a framework, but it's a framework that um, prompts us to ask different kind of questions. Uh, and, and, you know, that includes asking questions from the standpoint of the most marginalized, the excluded. Um, it helps move us beyond the questions of including women in foreign policy, which we touched on, to pushes us to intersectional approaches, which we've heard from each of our panelists, um, in ways that challenges the very structure of foreign policy. Um, we've heard a lot in, in today around actually transformation and dismantling power structure, transforming structures of power. Um, so we're not just putting different people at the same table. We're completely reimagining re what the table looks like. Um, so I do really want to thank all our panelists and I want to thank uh, all the people who have joined us today. Um, and I would like to hand over to Priyanka. Uh, from the Kubernetes Initiative uh, for some closing words uh, for our, our um, session today. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bettina. Um, I will not take too much time. What I have done is uh, we've had some fantastic uh, insights uh, from our panelists, and I have written down some of the words and phrases uh, that jumped up at me uh, at the end of this conversation. And I'm just gonna leave us with those words and phrases. Um, internal and external, but balancing internal and external, transforming systems, structures, and institutions, transforming status quo, checks and balances, inclusive, a holistic approach, a holistic vo voice, 
intersectionality rooted in local and regional contexts, language, the importance to ideas, transparent power dynamics, recognize, respect, and respond. Um, these were some of the words that had just jumped at me through our conversation. It was a very insightful discussion. Thank you very much uh, to all of our panelists and uh, to IWDA and the Kubernetes team as well, who's at the back end um, uh, booking uh, hard at making this possible. Thank you. Thank you so much, everyone.